today's scripture is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. You can find it on page 1000 of your pew Bibles. Listen now to the word of God. When Jesus had finished saying all of this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued very highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking, Will you come and heal this servant? When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves you to do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with him. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man of authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. This is the word of the Lord. The servant was healed. The soldier was commended for his great faith. I wonder what's the connection. Let's pray together. Lord, you can do anything you wish. And we know that your heart is for our best. So work as you will with what transpires in the next few moments with these words of mine, this word of yours, that we might find you present and active for Christ's sake. Amen. Here was this Roman soldier, a centurion who had been stationed in the uh, town of Capernaum uh, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he had a slave, and his slave was gravely ill. Hearing that Jesus was in the area, and evidently having heard about Jesus' healing ministry, he sent a delegation of Jewish elders to ask Jesus for help. But then this soldier apparently had a change of heart, or at least second thoughts, because he sent a second group of friends to intercept Jesus and tell him, don't bother coming. And his message was simple. If Jesus wished, he could simply say the word, and the servant would be healed. Luke says that Jesus was amazed at the centurion's faith, and he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. There are only two places in the Gospels where Jesus commended anybody for their great faith. One was a Canaanite woman with a sick daughter. The other was this Roman centurion. I find that remarkable. According to Jesus, the two top candidates for the People of Great Faith Award were not from the historic community of faith, God's chosen people. They were outsiders, a couple of unnamed Gentiles. It would appear that being a certified member of the family of faith does not automatically give you a leg up in this faith business. And so it makes you wonder, well, then what is it? What is it that makes for great faith? Is it the ability to move mountains? Is it the ability to heal the sick or to raise the dead? 
to come up with deep theological insights, to believe that you can lose in the New Hampshire primary and still be president? What does it mean to have great faith? Well, it may be true in some cases, but in our encounter today, we meet a man whose faith doesn't seem to be all that extraordinary, and yet we can see in him certain indelible marks of character that may give us some important clues as to how this great faith works, why it works. I see four marks of faith in this man, compassion, assertiveness, humility, trust. And I want to spend a few minutes looking at each of these character traits. First, it seems that this man's great faith is rooted in compassion. I say that because Luke says in verse 2 that there was a servant, literally a slave, that's the term, there was a slave who was sick and about to die, which, nothing remarkable about that. The extraordinary thing is that this slave's owner, a Roman soldier, cared deeply for him. That was remarkable. Uh, the, the New International Version uh, says that the master, master, quote, valued him highly. He valued him highly. Well, translating it that way might be a bit misleading. I mean, slaves by law were no different than any other property. But to that centurion, this wasn't just another piece of property, another valuable piece of equipment that he didn't want to lose. The word that is used to describe the master's attitude is entimos, entimos, and it literally means to hold precious, to hold dear to the heart. This slave was dear to him. That's unusual, to say the least. He had compassion. Is it possible to have faith without compassion? Well, theoretically, I suppose it's possible. But speaking quite practically, you remember James would later in his letter remind us that faith without caring, faith without any practical compassion, is dead, as good as dead. Jesus was impressed with this centurion's faith in part, I suspect, because his faith was rooted in his love for somebody whom society would say really wasn't worth the trouble. And according to the dominant values of that society, if a slave were sick or old or useless, he just got rid of him. Slaves were expendable, but not this one, not to this soldier. Luke says that this slave was held dear. He was precious. I wonder, have you ever felt like you were expendable? That the world would be probably just as well off or maybe better off if you just weren't around? Some, somebody may have even told you that you were worthless. And maybe you believed them. But then to your amazement and delight, you discovered that for reasons you can't explain, somebody, somebody held you very dear to their heart, cared for you deeply. If you've, if you've ever felt that way, perhaps you can begin to understand why Jesus was so impressed with this soldier's faith. It was rooted in compassion. And Jesus knew that a little compassion can work some remarkable miracles of healing. That's a part of what's at the heart of this centurion's faith, but there's a lot more. The second element of this centurion's faith is assertiveness. You know, you can, you can feel compassion for someone's plight. You can feel deeply sorry for them. But if that's all you feel is what you feel, and that's as far as it goes, what good is it? Faith is humanized by compassion, but even compassionate faith needs some practical way of expressing itself. 
Well, this centurion, he was a military man. He, he wasn't a physician. He, his, his dearly loved servant was dying, and there wasn't a blessed thing he could do about it. He knew that. But then he heard about Jesus, that he was in the area, and, and this man wasn't ashamed to go ask him for help. But, but how was he supposed to go about it? Well, verse 3 says that this Roman soldier sent a delegation of Jewish elders to plead for him. Now consider just what a remarkable move that was, considering the context. I mean, the Jews and the Romans hated each other, routinely, almost universally. Deep distrust and mutual bitterness, that was just normal. And yet the amazing thing about this Roman centurion was that when he asked the local elders to plead his case with Jesus, they went, and they went gladly. In fact, when they met Jesus and they made their request, this is what they said, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation. Again, we lose something in the translation because the phrase that we get in the New International Version, he loves our nation, it sounds rather like they were saying, well, he, he respects our country. No. Uh, but, but that phrase, agapa ethnos hemon, that's translated he loves our nation, really means he loves, agape loves our ethnic group. Hmm. In other words, they were saying to Jesus, he, 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 he doesn't just respect our country, He cares deeply for us as people. And when the elders described this, this man's remarkable character, that he had expressed this kind of practical love to people who hated everything he stood for, that he was willing to reach across the cultural chasm that, that, that existed between a hardened military man and an, and, a, and an itinerant Palestinian rabbi whom he'd never met, uh, and that this soldier would do all this for the sake of a slave whom he loved, well, that was evidently enough to persuade Jesus to go with them. And it's here that Luke introduces a third aspect of this centurion's remarkable faith, and that is his humility. Jesus wasn't far from the house when the centurion sent his close friends out with a second message. He told them to say to Jesus, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. You ever wonder why he sent that second message? Was, was he simply following the protocol of oriental hospitality, saying to Jesus, in effect, oh, no, no, I'm not worthy of your company. No, 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 please don't bother while all the while expecting Jesus would come anyway. Is that what was going on? Maybe. But judging from Jesus' reaction to him, there was something more going on there. I think it's just as likely that this centurion, who was accustomed to barking out orders to men, realized uh, that his brashness, his boldness in, in calling for Jesus the way he did, sending a delegation of elders, that could be construed as a kind of uh, brash presumptuousness on his part. I mean, after all, the, the Romans did have a reputation for taking whatever they wanted and uh, expecting to get whatever they asked for, but not this time. Not this time. No, this soldier went out of his way to, to send a special group out to say, Lord, don't Forgive me. Don't, don't trouble yourself. I was out of line in asking you to come to my house in the first place. Don't misread the, the centurion's humility here as though it were a kind of, oh, wretched worm that I am, sort of self-deprecation, uh, groveling. You know, as I read it, it the, the soldier was simply owning up to his mistake, admitting his limitations, saying, in effect, Lord, I, I just went too far. I goofed. I, I presumed too much. Don't bother. Does that make sense to you? Does, does it make sense that somebody could 
realized they'd made a, 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 a serious blunder, a social faux pas, and yet feel all right about himself? Is it possible to do that? Is it possible to own up to your limitations, to, to acknowledge your mistakes, however great they may be, to humble yourself and still feel good about yourself? Is it possible? Yeah, you bet it is. I learned an invaluable lesson about real humility, and it's a lesson I'll never forget. I was a, a seminary intern at the time, working at a church in North Seattle. When I was uh, doing youth ministry, I was working with this group of high school students in the church, and uh, she was part of that group. She was what they used to call back in the old days, educable, mentally retarded. She was slow. But the rest of the kids put up with her. One evening in the youth group, we were studying the, the Garden of Eden story, and uh, we read about how Adam and Eve had disobeyed God, and then they had to face up to their sins, how God came looking for them in the garden, and, and then God uh, had confronted them, uh, but then He had made clothes for them to protect them. Uh, that God did that, a, a, a sign that even though they had been a monumental disappointment to God, God still loved them. God still cared deeply for them. So that was the story, and that's what, that was the setup. And I gave each one of the, the students there a lump of modeling clay, and the, the instructions were to, to create something out of this modeling clay that would express how they would feel if they were in Adam or Eve's place and had just been clothed by God, told by God, you are such a disappointment, and yet I love you so much. And so they, everybody got into it, and, and well, that is everybody except this girl. She just sat there. He had her lump of clay, and she just sat there at the table kind of rolling this ball of clay in her hands. And after a while, I blew the whistle and said, okay, it's time. Everybody get together around the table, and they, they, they were going to show, their, uh, show off their creativity. Uh, and, and frankly, some of the models, some of, some of the things they came up with were highly imaginative, really neat, creative stuff. And everybody was having a good time, and then, then it was her turn. And she set this kind of lopsided, egg-shaped glob on the table. And she said, that's how I would feel. And some of the kids said, right, sure, uh-huh, mm -hmm. But she persisted. She said, that's how I feel. She said, I'm not perfect, but I'm whole. Oh, wow. That young woman taught us an immensely important lesson about humility that night. A lesson that none of us will forget. Yes, you can admit your imperfections and your limitations and still feel good about yourself. You may not be perfect, but you're whole because Jesus made you whole. That's real humility. And that's part of faith. That's part of this soldier's faith. Compassion and assertiveness, tempered with humility. That's the stuff of which extraordinary faith is made. But there is one more element to faith, it seems to me, and that element is trust. In verse 7, the centurion went on to say to Jesus, just say the word. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, he does it. According to Luke, when Jesus heard this message, he was amazed at this man's faith. Why? 
I think it's because the centurion was saying to Jesus, in effect, Lord, I trust you implicitly. I don't pretend to understand how your healing works. All I know is that I have some experience with authority. I know how it works in my own professional and personal life. I sense in you that same authority. And, and while I don't understand how you heal people, I understand enough to trust that you can and you will heal this man if you choose. It's a case of simple trust. Which reminds me of the story of the two nuns who were on their way to the Catholic hospital and their car ran out of gas. They passed a gas station a couple of blocks back and so they were going to go back and get some gas, but when they looked in the trunk, there was no gas can. All there was, in fact, was a bedpan. So they took the bedpan, went back to the gas station, filled it up with unleaded, brought it back to the car, opened the, the lid, started to pour the unleaded gas into the gas tank from the bedpan. About that time, two ministers drove by on their way to a presbytery meeting, and they looked at them, and one said to the other, I wish our folks had that kind of faith. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, that is silly. The faith of the centurion, on the other hand, was not implausible. <laughs> it wasn't foolish or foolhardy. In fact, his faith was profoundly reasonable. You know why? It's because he reasoned from what he knew to be true to what might therefore be true. He saw how the power of authority worked in his own life, and he reasoned that authority in Jesus' hands could do even more. He knew that his own authority was limited, and so he trusted Jesus to do for him what he couldn't do for himself. And it's right here that we get that this encounter with Jesus, uh, the story gets really close to home for all of us. I say that because according to Luke, that centurion never once laid eyes on Jesus. Never had a chance to sit down and talk with the Lord face to face. But that didn't stop him from trusting Jesus. You and I have never laid eyes on Jesus. As far as I know, none of us has had the privilege of sitting down to a face-to-face -face chat with our Lord. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. But like the centurion, it needn't stop us from trusting Jesus either. God alone knows for sure why it was that Jesus singled out this man for his great faith. We do know, however, or at least we have some strong clues about the character of that man's faith. It was rooted in compassion. It was willing to be assertive. It was tempered with humility. And it was ready to trust without benefit of full understanding. And it would appear that with this kind of faith, remarkable things can happen. Do remember this. Faith is a gift. It's a gift of God. And I pray God will give us that kind of faith. Let's pray. Lord, if there's anyone here today who may have what is to all appearances a pretty strong faith and does, just doesn't catch the connection between having faith and showing compassion, mercy. Would you please whack them alongside the head with a two by four, whatever it takes, Lord, to make, get their attention, make them see what your servant James said, that without caring, without working at it, Faith is dead. 
as good as dead. And if there's anyone here today, Lord, who just feels deep concern for others, and that's as far as it goes, to really hurt for those who hurt. But that's as far as it, uh, as the expression goes. God, please, please move them, show them, help them to understand that they have to act on it, that they have to do something about it. Ask for help. Offer help. And if there's anyone here today who's just so full of faith and full of himself because he knows how much faith he has, I ask you, Lord, of your mercy, knock him down a peg or two. Teach us humility, those of us who need it. And for all of us, none of whom has the, the final word or the perfect answer to every question. I pray you give us grace to trust you. Even when we don't understand how it works or why, but to trust your goodness. And I dare pray that because you've already proven how very much you love us in the gift of your life. And you've proven to us already how trustworthy you are in rising from the dead and promising to never leave us or forsake us. Lord, give us faith, that kind of faith. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.